Welcome, everybody. Um, it's early morning here in the States, but like I know it's like end of the afternoon for many of you who are joining for um, from Europe. Um, this is the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling Systems webinar series. Um, I, my name is Irina Overeem. I am the uh, Deputy Director of CSDMS. Um, it, CSDMS, for those of you who don't know, has been around for um, about 15 years now. It's an NSF, so National Science Foundation uh, funded program that um, um, promotes modeling in the earth service processes. And so our facility um, has been rallying the communicating, educating people about sustainable software and fair software development, um, and building a bit of like cyber infrastructure tools to like enable people um, um, building their own like scientific software. And so, the team includes software engineers, and I saw like Mark is, for example, is here too. And uh, one of the purposes of these CSD Mass Euro um, webinars is to exchange idea with like other Earth Service Process modelers uh, um, that are Euro European based and uh, are doing have similar programs and do similar things, um, and see what we can learn from each other. And so Sam rallied the uh, British Antarctic survey uh, cyber infrastructure team and um, we're gonna hear from Jonathan and um, Johnny goes by Johnny um, I I suspect um, and from James so I'll hand it over to Sam thank you yeah so this is basically yeah. these European yeah. things um, came around because we've got a little bit of seed corn funding uh, which is aimed at bringing communities together um, and so as Irina says we're looking at um, telling people about the CSDMS community over here and, and vice versa telling the CSDMS community and broader you know what some of the exciting digital things going on in Europe are. Um, thanks very much for US folk joining us so early in the morning. Um, I know it's early particularly early especially if you go west <laughs> west of Colorado. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, we've got, I've got one little bit of advertising to do before I hand over to James and Johnny. Um, we have a, we're co-organizing a workshop um, with CSDMS in the UK in October time. Um, and so I just wanted to say, hold this date. We haven't got any specific information as in terms of what the content will be and, and logistics, et cetera. Um, but we do have dates and that's the 28th to the 31st of October. Um, and it'll be a workshop hosted in the Lake District, which is the Northwest of the UK, or Northwest of England rather. Um, and we'll be looking broadly at things around what, what enables the next generation of of environmental modeling. Um, details a little bit fuzzy at the moment, but watch this space over the next few months as we as we flesh out details there. And it would be great to see some of you guys there. And I can see some familiar um, names in the audience that I know will be really interested in the workshop. So that's great. Um, yeah, as Irina says, we have James and Johnny from the British Antarctic Survey here today. Um, they are going to be telling us about, or to read their title, Developing AI and Research Pipelines for Operational Use um, Towards Digital Twins. And I won't give any more by way of an introduction because I'm, they will go through it all in their talk themselves. So James and Johnny, do you want to get your slides up and check we're all working okay? Brilliant, that's looking good. So I'll hand over to you. Excellent, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, thanks uh, CSDMS for having us along. Uh, so uh, I'm James Byrne. Uh, I'm lead research software engineer at the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, and I'll just uh, allow uh, Jonathan to do a quick intro as well. Um, Hi, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm a um, principal research scientist uh, who is co-leading the autonomous marine operations planning side in the AI lab. And uh, just for those who, of you who might not know, uh, the British Antarctic Survey is uh, unsurprisingly the British effort towards uh, polar research and operations. So we cover both Antarctic uh, and uh, the Arctic as well, uh, but also anywhere that has uh, an interest in cryospheric uh, science and uh, related scientific disciplines as well. So um, it's a very multidisciplinary uh, 
research organization. Um, so the, the point of us coming along here is really uh, not to focus necessarily on modeling, but to try and state where we are in the British Antarctic Survey and the Natural Environment Research Council, who are who are our administrative body, um, with respect to uh, building uh, pipelines towards digital twins. So uh, we're very much looking at the uh, how we're applying software engineering practices in the polar research domains. Uh, and we're aiming uh, and what we're we're trying to describe what we're aiming for uh, by employing the concept of digital twins. So I, I understand that Gordon Blair gave a, a talk uh, to the group very recently. Uh, I, I know Gordon and um, he's definitely the person you want to be talking to uh, when talking about digital twins because he will definitely make you enthusiastic for them. So I'm not going to tread on his turf at all. Um, so uh, but what is really important is uh, how we're looking at coupling the data and process driven approaches that exist within the organization and how software engineering helps us do that. Um, so just to go through how we're going to cover that. So uh, we're looking at the stages from research through uh, from research and experimentation through to operations and then following on to impact. So this is very much how our strategic vision um, our strategic vision within NERC and, and uh, BAS is, is structured is how do we make sure that research is delivering not only our operations, but also impacts at the end of it. So that's very much the the, the stages from motivation uh, through to research. So in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, IceNet CIS forecasting, um, how we then use pipelines in order to apply that research into an operational domain. Then John is going to go through the autonomous marine operations planning infrastructure. So that's uh, really wrapping around around pipelines um, and then we'll start defining how we are uh, approaching digital twins through standardized approaches across all of these different endeavors. Um, so starting off with motivations, just to be very uh, start right at the uh, start right at the start, um, that we're, we're obviously focused in the British Antarctic Survey um, on studying the balance between ice and water and their interaction with uh, other global climate systems. So I don't think I need to explain to anyone here that uh, the Antarctic Arc and Arctic are very uh, significant influences towards climate. Um, and we need to understand this at a variety of different scales and across a variety of different domains. Um, but in doing that, we need to uh, be looking at driving real world impact. So uh, we're not purely research focused. We very much integrate research into our, the way we uh, approach our planning and operations. Um, we aid decision making uh, to optimize uh, the use of our resources. We're contributing to wider approaches environmentally and technologically. Uh, we're influencing environmental uh, and ecosystem conservation through our partnerships uh, with other organizations. Uh, and we're very much looking at influencing uh, policy making and reporting. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it shows that, you know, we, we need to be considering things at quite a high level uh, at all times. So I'm going to start by talking about IceNet. So this is something that I'm personally involved uh, with very heavily, and I use it as a sort of case uh, a case in point as to why we take the approaches that we do uh, when thinking towards longer term goals like digital twins. Um, so it's a very useful frame uh, of reference because it very much started off as a research project. So up the top there, you'll see a very deep convolutional network, very common uh, infrastructure called the convolution uh, called the unit. Sorry. Um, and we basically couple, we use that in order to process uh, historical sea ice observations, atmospheric data, potentially other forms of data in order to produce sea ice uh, uh, predictions at the output. Now, this was done a few years ago some, by, some, uh, by an excellent researcher called uh, Tom Anderson, and he generated some research code. But then we've really worked out how to then wrap that into the uh, the funny little diagram you see on the right there with what I call the ice net onion. So this is very much taking research and a, or what could be considered a model and then wrapping it in a pipeline an infrastructure and an ecosystem and so that's what i'm going to go through here so um it's an example of enabling and lowering the barrier to ongoing research um whilst uh looking to deliver multilateral uh operational integrations and to do that we've got some key characteristics that we imposed say imposed that we converted tom's original um 
ISNET code base uh, with. So we first started off by uh, turning it into a very a dedicated Python library. So rather than it just being research code base, we very much formulated it into a, something that could be maintained and used uh, very easily by other researchers and operations. Um, we then incorporated patterns and common approaches to software engineering that allowed us to um, to utilize different AI ML backends. That's further lowering the barrier for people who were doing uh, research into these methods. Um, and we also designed it in such a way that it would be very easy to uh, fit into workflow systems. So this then lowers the barrier to operationalizing these types of this type of research. Uh, and finally, we um, we very much looked at the code base that had resulted from all of this and said, well, how can we start to decompose the common functionality out of it and then generalize it to other environmental forecasting use cases? Um, so hopefully that will become a bit more obvious. But one thing to note here is that whenever we're producing or whenever anyone produces research like this, be it machine learning or otherwise, they start to produce lots of digital assets that then really communicate the value of that uh, of that product, um, if you like. Um, so ISNET's library can produce all kinds of analysis and some of them are displayed here, comparisons with uh, observational models or like uh, metrics around um, how it's performing. Um, but these uh, these tools that uh, are embedded within it are not necessarily restricted to a single purpose. Um, the purpose of the IceNet library um, is very much around sea ice forecasting. So that offers us an opportunity to say, well, OK, uh, how can we in my software engineering lingo incorporate the Unix philosophy? We can build a library that does one thing. It does it extremely well, but then it delivers all of the assets elsewhere. And that's very much uh, in keeping with the Unix philosophy, which uh, basically goes on along two points, which is make each thing do one thing well and then think that all outputs will become another thing's input. Um, and that very much like drove that central bubble of the onion that I described earlier. So in building out, <laughs> as, as we layered up that functionality, so you end up with a library in the middle and you'll see in the top left of this diagram, uh, the little IceNet library, and it literally is just called IceNet. But then you can build a whole suite of different um, tools and approaches alongside it in order to then uh, layer up the, uh, the automation, the interaction with other things. Um, some of these elements got... Um, some of these uh, elements got generalized. So uh, there's there's things called the uh, one which is work in progress is called the download toolbox, which uh, allows us to download all of the forms of data that we necessarily need uh, in order to run this pipeline. But that can then be used by other pipelines as well. Um, also, there's a model ensembler which uh, deals with uh, running very large ensembles or very small ensembles, if you really want to, um, of, of these models uh, uh, as well. Um, and we're in the process of decomposing this so that it's so that these uh, tools can be used elsewhere. So ISNET is still on a journey. As you can see, there's only a couple of generalized tools out of this, but uh, many more have been designed with this, uh, you know, tear it out and use it for something else uh, in the future. And you'll see why that's important as we go through. Um, the other reason to think about wrapping that initial ISNET library in a pipeline layer explicitly um, is because it facilitates us scaling out both our research and operations. It allows many people to be working on things at the same time without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, but it also allows us to automate things uh, should we be feeding them between other systems. And this is definitely where my software engineering hat comes on, which you'll hear quite strongly. And uh, Jonathan will hopefully balance me out a little bit with some proper science later on. Um, but we are very much minimizing the duplication of data and effort. So on the left, like we uh, we have a consistent data store, like fed by the download toolbox now, uh, that actually allows us to share uh, the source data across many different uh, runs and many different experiments that people might be doing. Um, it also allows for uh, a lot of configurability between these different environments. So you'll see there that they're called ephemeral environments. It allows us to actually feed a config into a, a kind of blind, a blank environment, as it were, and just dump the config in there and then reproduce the results that were previously encountered. 
Um, conversely, conversely, you can just blow them away and minimize your usage. And if you're running in HPCs and things like this, which is very helpful. Um, so the ISNet pipeline is very simple when drawn by this, but uh, drawn like this, but it can be implemented in a number of different ways. Uh, at the moment, we just use Bash for the environment setup, which might seem pretty archaic, but it works extremely well because it makes it extremely portable between HPCs. Um, it uses the library, so these pipelines are not actually part of the library itself. It's, it's another repository, it's another thing that wraps the IceNet library, which can then continue to progress through different releases. And then the, the, the pipeline is slightly agnostic to whatever uh, version of IceNet you're using. Uh, as I said, we can use ensembling tools and configuration management quite easily. The outputs of the run, so those digital assets uh, I mentioned that are created by the library, uh, can be made quite easily um, standards compliant. So we actually uh, call tools that are baked into the library in order to associate things like CF convention or compliant metadata uh, to the outputs, provided the pipeline is successful in producing a, 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 re a reasonable output. And that actually drives logic further down the chain. Um, and it's kind of implicit documentation as well. So having uh, these this separate layer of, uh, of, an, of a, pipe, a data pipeline, as it were, or an implementation of how to use the system or the library, sorry, at its core, kind of acts as a, a form of implicit documentation, which actually makes it quite easy to say to someone, this is how you run a forecast, because there's actually a script here that runs all of the, the, the library components that produce a forecast from end to end. Um, so, there's a lot of complexity that could you know you could say oh well why not put it all into the library but then it makes the library extremely difficult to sort of generalize or break apart or modularize uh, and certainly it makes it a little bit more difficult to create these kind of ephemeral environments that can be spun up and destroyed very quickly um the other the other thing to note as well this very much this decoupling of the uh, of the model at the heart of uh, any of these infrastructures um is very much um it very much allows us to look at automation so if you're talking about uh, operationalizing your data pipelines in order to feed other systems then um you definitely want to be approaching a workflow management system and looking at triggering all of these things automatically and studying their outputs um so that gets me on to talking about infrastructures and why we might want to do that kind of crazy automation well as I say, we're a very multidisciplinary organization. Um, we do a lot of science around the polar regions, and that means there's a lot of heterogeneous data uh, in the mix. Uh, there's a lot of different fields of study, but people might want to create complex systems uh, from from many outputs that exist within this uh, within this landscape. So the scale, diversity, and potential in impact of uh, coupling these systems together uh, demands that we take some software engineering approach approaches to the uh, integration of them. And that definitely drives us towards standardization. So you'll see a few things around here. We do uh, quite a lot of work in machine learning around sea ice and iceberg tracking. Uh, we have a lot of Earth observation pipelines and numerical simulations uh, relating to uh, ice sheet modeling and uh, an observation of wildlife from space, for example. We see ice net on the top right there. Uh, we also have remote sensor networks, which are very much another field of study that I'm interested in. So things like Iridium communications from a variety of different uh, uh, experiments in the field are very important. We're also looking quite a lot at data improvement using various uh, types of research. Uh, so these can be, if these are reusable libraries or you know have exemplar pipelines, they can be dropped in nice and easily. Uh, and then we have static data sets and uh, and and ship and uh, remote uh, vehicles that I'm definitely not going to tread on Johnny's uh, uh, talk in the moment. So. Hopefully, I've demonstrated that the only sustainable operational data, uh, environmental data science and will employ some level of pipeline development uh, to deliver the digital assets uh, in, uh, and impacts responsibly and efficiently. Um, I'm a software sustainability fellow. I know Sam is as well. Uh, and a big part of this is actually... Um, you know advocating for approaches that are going to reduce the uh the impact of what we're, the negative impacts of what we're doing in environmental data science if you're an environmental data scientist that is 
Um, so now moving on to infrastructure. Um, so why, why you might ask, uh, are we talking about infrastructure in a slightly different way to the pipelines themselves? Well, it allows us to share the digital assets used and provided from uh, systems consistently. That's allowing uh, people to undertake research, do the operational integration. Uh, it's a way of feeding systems that might then be responsible for furthering on those assets to other places. Um, it's also a form of education and appropriation. It's a way of like giving people uh, tran um, transparent access, fair access to the digital assets under the hood. So you definitely want to be looking at infrastructure in a different vein to the pipelines themselves, which can tend to be quite complex and uh, heavily developed. Um, so again, we go back to the motivations of why we're doing this. So once the pipeline assets are produced, they're delivered to one of potentially many hosted infrastructures that we might have. In the case of IceNet, this could be uh, to talk about where we might want to place new sensors or where um, in, in particular we collaborate with WWF on uh, various uh, elements of uh, ecosystem conservation. Uh, and uh, there's a bit there about autonomous marine operations planning that, again, I'm not going to uh, touch on Johnny's turf too much. But this is where the digital assets get fed out into other infrastructures in order to uh, help them uh, do what they need to do. Um, is as I say, when you separate out into a separate, uh, when you separate the pipeline and the infrastructures from one another, the the digital assets you produce within the pipelines then become your interface uh, that uh, between the two. Which means the infrastructure can develop very, very fast and very heavily and be modularized in uh, in great ways, um, as long as it just deals with the compliant data that you're producing from the pipelines. And that layer of separation really helps you to uh, iterate quickly. Um, so I won't talk too much more about that, but um, I will hand over to Johnny now. Oh, sorry, I've missed the slide there. So these are some of the uh, the infrastructure interfaces that we have. Sorry. So uh, you will have, uh, as I mentioned, we have a collaboration with the government and Nunavut and WWF. We provide a variety of different forecasts. We The infrastructure provides things like APIs as well as uh, user interfaces, but also automated systems that uh, then send alerts out to people. Um, so now I will definitely hand over to Johnny. There you go, Johnny. Perfect. Thanks, James. So I'm going to talk briefly about autonomous marine operations planning. So what we've been doing in this work is we've got a proviso to meet net zero carbon production by 2040. And this is under the Natural Environment Research Council and BAS is part of that council. So one of the main aspects of carbon for the whole of BAS is 60% of the carbon is produced through ship operations. So any reduction that we can make in ship operations and think of ways to do things differently can actually lead to significant carbon savings. So our work in autonomous marine operations planning is looking at using these pipelines that James has discussed before to first dynamically mesh the digital environment. And that's on the left, left hand side represented by Meshify. And then to constrain how things like sea ice or ocean currents or winds or waves affects the response of the ship or autonomous vessels. So what we do is we take all these different um, forecasts or legacy data sets, we mesh them to create a digital environment. We then determine what the ship actually can do, then do in that digital environment before going to the next stage of the project where we do eco and time-friendly polar navigation. So you can think of this work very similar to Google Maps. As you get in your car, you now get a specified fuel usage route as well as the quickest route. So we're taking characteristics of how our ice breaking vessel, the Sir David Attenborough, responds in sea ice conditions. And we can actually then incorporate this into a route planning scheme to then determine the fuel usage for this vessel between a start location and the destination. But it doesn't just stop there. So when we actually get in the ice, things change a bit. So you can consider the next stage of the project as um, something like Tesla's autopilot. So you're changing lanes on a motorway is constantly determining the risk of these um, actions that you're taking. So the other work that we're well underway and we'll look forward to share in the future is um, ice router. So this is a probabilistic machine learning method um, that can incorporate uncertainty in the sea ice conditions and then uh, determine risk aware routing at much higher resolution. And then once we've got this understanding of the fuel usage for these different marine routes, we can go to the next stage. So it's taking a, 
a level out. And this is autonomous marine planning. So you can consider like uh, Amazon delivery logistics. When you get a package delivered, they've determined what the best uh, van to put the package on is. And then also in their delivery logistics, they now incorporate in the States a, uh, a left hand, a right hand turn. So they take a lot of right hand turns to minimize the risk of going across traffic. So what we're doing here is we're using these digital environments. We're using the polar route work that we've been doing and then putting it all into an AI logistics planner. So this is a heuristic based um, planning scheme. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm just going to talk you through polar route uh, first, and then we'll go through a very brief background to the logistics planner. So we're leveraging all this environmental information to determine these carbon and fuel efficient routes. And we're now um, operationalizing this on the bridge of the Sir David Attenborough. So just for this little example here, which is taken at the peninsula uh, around Antarctica, this uh, transit would take about one day, 18 hours. And by taking the eco-friendly route, you're increasing your transit time by 14 minutes, but you're having a saving of almost 4% carbon. And what does this equate to? Well, it's the same as running a petrol powered car for almost two years. And then that's an insane saving that you can make only by increasing your transit time in 14 minutes. And then using this work, we can go on to the next stage. So James, if you switch to the next slide. So scientists are submitting um, ship time by application forms. So we can leverage this information to then say, can we organize the science being done into a better system to minimize the fuel usage. So what we see on the left hand side is the uh, marine facility planner where scientists would submit their science proposals. In the middle, you'll see a ship time application form um, with some key information. So this task, for example, is a cruise. It, it requires a total of uh, 60 plus days and goes from Puerto Serenas to Puerto Serenas. And then the next stage is to understand constraints about the the item that could be doing this task so for a ship it would be this is what the crew would need this is the equipment you would need a ship has to be operational for the whole time of the task and this is like giving very basic constraints uh, as machine code that a, a planner would be using as they're going through this decision so then once we've done that you can move on to the next slide so we can then add constraints and all these things and we can look into three different time scales so if we can if we're able to reconcile a good planning scheme, we can look at ways that we could have improved in the past to minimize fuel usage. We can look at ways that we can plan five years plus ahead. And then also we can quickly plan at very short uh, time intervals. This is called now casting. So if something goes wrong, shit hits the fan, um, a mechanical problem arises, we can replan multiple um, months ahead or even multiple years. And this is only possible if we leverage the full understanding of environmental forecasting, route planning, and marine logistics planning. And in the marine logistics planning, we're basically leveraging the constraints that a marine planner would use. And if you move to the final slide, my section, we, we've just done a proof of concept where we've looked at the National Oceanography Center or NOC, um, previous five years from 2017 to 2023. This would normally take three weeks to manually plan this. And our initial proof of concept, this is early stages of this project. We've already got a fuel saving. OK, it's only 0.3 percent, but that equates to 60,000 pounds worth in cost savings. Um, and this is equivalent to uh, 60,000 tons uh, of fuel. And it takes the marine planner, the autonomous AI system, three minutes while it would take a marine planner three weeks. So we're now giving these marine planners uh, decision support tools that they can quickly try new scenarios or test out new ideas. So we're going to basically expand this going forward and um, it basically expand to the next stages. So I'll pass back to James. Cool. Thank you very much, Johnny. So uh, I just move on to the uh, the last layer of the bubble. or I oh, say bubble. Sorry. It's a bubble diagram, but it's the last layer of the onion. You'll be glad to hear. So, um, so the end game for Bass is to be looking at the idea of an Antarctic digital twin. So I drew this uh, this uh, uh, diagram a long time ago when we were trying to work out how the Sir David Attenborough fit in with the idea of having an Antarctic digital twin uh, with all of these different systems uh, working together. And I think this comes back to what Gordon was talking about in his talk uh, in Praise of the Arrow or when he was talking about in Praise of the Arrows. It's the idea of all of these systems 
being able to talk to one another in so much as you can couple the data and process models together to ask some of the questions that you need to uh, as an integrated question, as it were. Um, but in order to do that, you can't build an infrastructure every time. You can't build a, or you shouldn't have to build a large middleware infrastructure every time you want to ask a new question. Um, so this idea of having a, a minimal middleware implementation basically uh, requires data models, process models, operational models, all to exhibit some standards when they are built uh, so that you can quite easily come along and say, I tell you what, I need some information from over here and over here in order to ask some of the questions. And this is really, I think, where uh, Johnny's team um, has been uh, focusing their efforts. Um, for the environment, is obviously very difficult, but um, the recent program called the Information Management Framework for Environmental Digital Twins, which is not a short title, so we call it IMFE, um, really looked into what are the governance and implementation uh, structures that you need to think about in order to make things interoperable by default. Um, with the with IceNet in mind, I drew this uh, diagram, and really the only things that need to change are the catalog descriptions of what assets make up IceNet uh, and the presentation of those two other components that you might want to integrate. Now, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but actually, it doesn't that that really conforms to this thin middle approach to building complex systems. Um, and it's also very uh, important for consistency in building sustainable infrastructure, uh, because then you're minimizing the amount of overhead that you have to imp that you have to maintain in order to uh, um, in order to sustain that integration uh, for whatever purpose it is, which is very important if you're in if you've ever done any support work. So um, this is a work in progress, and the IMFE was very much looking at the top down approach to how to do this. But uh, we're also very keen that there's a bottom up set of developments that are just looking at building something that conforms to this initial picture. And then over time, the emergence of digital twins in the environment will become more of a reality. Um, so just to go through a notion of generalizing this, so obviously I talked about IceNet there, I kind of came up with this uh, diagram, which basically says that you would have a similar template across all of the uh, components that might need to interoperate. So the, the only real point to look at on the left really is the, the things that you're describing to other people. So it might be the generalized components that they can incorporate into their own systems. Uh, the data that they might want to use to ask questions and the assets within uh, any given um, component. Generalizing these uh, kind of um, implementations is also very important, uh, as I say, for um, for people being able to adopt things within their own systems. So in the case of IceNet, we we're looking at CI's concentration, but should we want to come and uh, use these uh, things like the ensembling tool, for example, have been successfully used in ice sheet emulation, where we've got a numerical model, uh, a process-based model that uh, requires some level of emulation in order to be operationally uh, ex give operationally expedited answers and this is something that we're looking at internally but you can do this across the board you can say okay at the infrastructure level we might want to have conformant interfaces that are consistent across different sets of predictive uh, predictive systems or in the case of uh, things like the the routing packages you might have a whole load of cartographic infrastructure for displaying routes um, and this is where really where it comes from it's building things with that generalizability in mind uh, and so this just brings me on to the very last sort of summary of uh, of building our inf environmental digital research infrastructure. Um, so it's uh, building an infrastructure of the future. So it's very much building it a brick at a time. So I won't mention, as it's being recorded, the name of the blocks that are on the right hand side there, because I don't want to get into a trademark uh, issue. Um, but there are some clear principles that we should probably embody. So common capabilities should be exploited and openly utilized. Uh, so that's very much advocating for the open source approach. Uh, we should foster the community development far and wide and efforts like this uh, where we can come and talk to you and, and hopefully you can connect with us are, are great for that because only by building communities are we really gonna understand what's already available. Uh, we need to make it easy to align to existing efforts from the outset. So that is very much looking at the strategic uh, ideas that are coming top down, uh, but also then being willing to uh, um, align to them uh, from the bottom up as well, and hopefully therefore driving them. 
Uh, we need to remember that our environmental research is often used in other contexts. So operational infrastructures are very important to BAS, but you might also, uh, we might also need to just remember that uh, there might be social impacts, there might be social uses for what we're doing as well. Uh, we're trying to uh, champion new environmental data science through the community, as I said, um, and we should be uh, willing to showcase uh, high impact uh, solutions that can be reused elsewhere and promoting that reuse. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I've always got a nice onion at the end because I really like the alliums. So um, hopefully there's a couple of questions and uh, please do feel free to connect with Jonathan or myself on the emails there. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing that. Thank you very much both. That was that was really, really interesting. Um have we got any questions from the audience? I think you can unmute yourself or put your hands up uh or put your question in the chat if you'd rather do neither, and I'll keep my eye on the chat. To get us warmed up, um I kind of feel like BAS is ahead of the game in a lot of senses in this realm. Like what you were talking about there, James, seemed really well developed. Uh, and I'm kind of curious how much how much of that was developed out of necessity, because for instance, you have this, you have ships, you have autonomous things um, that you need to route, uh, as as the example that Johnny gave there. So how much of it was developed out of necessity and how much of it was um pre-planned so and i think what really my question here is um how how much of the thinking behind this was done beforehand and you sat down as an organization and thought we need to build this digital infrastructure we need to build this onion <laughs> to use your analogy uh, how much of it was done reactively like for instance you you build the the research bit in the center of the onion and then realize that you need the next layer and then the next layer yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you. I think the I would love to say it was all pre-planned and uh, orchestrated from a strategic level, but I would be slightly disingenuous if I were to do so. Um, I think there has been a bit of one of the benefits of working for BAS and the Natural Environment Research Council uh, as a whole, I think, is that all of the organisations have this sort of mix between research and operations. So you end up with a very diverse pool of talent that is offering new opinions and I think it very much when we see uh, the AI lab for example at Bass that actually gave rise to the partnership with the Alan Turing Institute who are uh, the AI leaders in in the UK uh, that gave rise to Icenet that created research but then it was allowing people to see it and promoting it uh, that then sort of gave us the impetus for someone like me to come along and say well actually I work in IT and I've worked in industry uh, if you really Really want to make that available and useful to people then you need to start wrapping it in uh you know nice friendly layers that people can come along and integrate with and i think so it, it is it, it's always going to be a mixture of proactive and reactive but i think it, this really sort of points at community is the thing that makes it work is is really just allowing people to input ideas and then seeing where they go i mean the some things have been you know not i wouldn't say unmitigated disasters but certainly we've had a few threads that have collapsed um but then we've had other threads like the amop team who utilize the ice net forecast where that research because of our need to get to net zero has just ballooned and uh, johnny i don't know if you want to come in there like because the team is growing very quickly yeah, this um, reactive side of things was probably the main driving factor. Um, as things are changing and as we've got these new targets to meet, you have to have an infrastructure that can support it. And there, there's talk of um, scaling to the point by 2040 to have hundreds of autonomous vessels all operating together. And the only way to do that is to actually have the infrastructure that can support it. And just to pick up on that, I think that's where there's a clear strategic direction, but the 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 points in the roadmap are not like yet always uh, fought out. So that's what we do reactively. I feel. <laughs> Brill, thank you. Any questions from other folks? I was curious about um, the fact that you start presenting like multiple sources of data, like AI uh, generated predictions. Um, and like 
Then there's like end users that are really like trying to make decisions and doing policy with it, right? You're talking about like the connections to the world, um, WWF, etc. And so I wondered like how difficult it is to communicate like sort of the uncertainty in that whole process and whether that's like acceptable to your like decision-making like partners. Yeah, it's really, I mean, from a, from a predictive point of view, that's, really troublesome of course is how do you represent uncertainty in any of these types of systems i think the big thing for me is not being a, a an environmental research per se researcher per se but rather than someone who builds those environmental infrastructures is to be very clear about what product is it is that you're developing and what solution it is in the real world context of that, that uncertainty so you say for example to put a, a case in point if we're going to develop an early warning alert system, then the research associated with the logic behind that is public research. So that, you know, they have a scientific publication that backs up the reasoning for having an alert based on it. Um, but at that point, you know, you're as a technologist, I'm handing over that to public research that says this is the method used. You have to be sure that you want to use that method in order to inform, say, a community at the very end. Um, I think that's really important as well, is that we, you know, you're not removing your uh, the scientific life cycle here you're like supplementing it with digital delivery um and you're not claiming that one because this is a danger with ai in particular it is for it to say oh well we we built this really fancy tool why don't you trust it and it's just kind of like well you have to prove it like, it's not a, it's not a, an all or nothing <laughs> yeah great any other questions I've got one for Johnny, actually. Um, so this this AMOP tool sounds like it would be more broadly useful than just to um, BAS. And my question is simply, is it being used outside of BAS or the research councils, or is it is it kind of internal only? So the aim in the long run is to tie into the Marine Facility Planner, which is currently being used by many different national um, Antarctic research councils. So I think the Australian group is using it, the Norwegians, uh, there's several inside the UK that are using it. But at this stage, we're only very early days. Um, so in the long run, it will be tied into a pre-existing system, but we need to first get the proof of concept there and get it along the line. Brilliant, thank you. We have a question from Juan. Sorry for the pronunciation, if that was incorrect. Oh no, it's uh, it's great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, Doctor Byron. Uh, okay, uh, I I wonder if, uh, how, from your perspective, how do you see applying this ar architecture or a uh, modification of of it to a. a coastal water quality monitoring program, like uh, something related to, to monitoring hydrodynamics and, but that has like, several layers of, of uh, for example, socioeconomic and socioecological variables and also has to deal with this decision making like pipeline. How, how do you see it applied to it? Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good, good question. So I think, um, so we, at, uh, in NERC, we have uh, several different centres. So uh, we actually have a centre for ecology and hydrology, who I think would be quite well placed with this, but uh, in, in terms of the specific implementation, but actually there is a collective effort uh, that uh, called the Environmental Data Service that is really looking at how do we make uh, the heterogeneous data sources available almost as quickly as possible, one might say. Um, so you would use pipelines in that case in order to take data sets, offer if there's any way of automating quality assurance and publication, uh, uh, the publication process uh, of a data set and making it available within that environmental data service. You then build your infrastructures on top of that in order to provide data delivery uh, or, or particular use cases. And then obviously, or well, say obviously, but then that availability of data through something like the environmental data service would then allow you to build the digital twins, as it were, that uh, allow people to ask questions of these uh, disparate data sources. So I think the the specific um, 
yeah, the specific hydrodynamic question I can't answer to, but the the general consensus, I think it's fair to say within NERC is that actually we have to be building these types of pipelines and infrastructure in a generalized sense so that everyone can benefit. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. And I think in a, in a lot of senses, that's where strategic proactive planning kind of comes in because it's it, it, it's quite a difficult task, isn't it? Thinking about data coming from different research centers, from different disciplines, et cetera. Um, and I think we're probably only really at the start of that journey and thinking about, you know, what the environmental data service, the EDS could do in terms of, you know, providing data that could be used in digital twins and that type of research infrastructure. Yeah, definitely at the start of the journey. I think the promising thing is that by having all of the centres involved in a project like that, you're enabling, you're bringing everyone into the conversation. The worst thing is that you develop digital research infrastructure, which is then bespoke to an individual centre and then try and retrofit it somewhere else. So at least it's acknowledged as, like you say, a strategic development. It's very important. And I suppose, guess, opening opening this out to not just the UK and our research centres, um, a lot of this would be then generally applicable across any group of organisations that, that have data around the broad environment or social things. Um, just because we're talking about UK research centres doesn't mean that a lot of this stuff isn't applicable elsewhere. I think that's a really important point, actually, um, is that the idea of digital twins, as Gordon rightly pointed out, uh, you know, that comes from the engineering and built environment more than anywhere else. Um, certainly as an ex-aeronautical engineer uh, or involved with aeronautical engineering, they were very commonly used, but they were constrained. Uh, so we've taken that influence and we should definitely be forwarding it on to other areas that might be interested in adopting these technologies. So openness is very important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just listening to like how powerful um, this technology could be and the, the shipping planning, like actually like triggered sort of this idea of like, wow, if you would do this in the Arctic, it would like actually be used for like Arctic shipping and like potentially like for like vessel movements that like are strategic or like military or so like so. I don't know, it, it seemed that the the openness of like sort of the scientific development or the development for this for scientific purposes is a bit of a conflict in that um, in that realm, potentially. Um, so, yeah, I don't know whether you've like heard anything about that or um, gotten some other people to comment on that. So at BAS, we have to um, adhere to the open source code. Um, which mm -hmm. I think is great, which means that everyone can use it. Uh, there's always that proviso that you can use it at your own risk and for your own operations. But the the advantage that it has, if you use, say, a route planning software to save fuel, no matter what it's being used to save fuel for, it's still a benefit saving fuel. So mm -hmm. I, it, it's a difficult moral problem, that one. But. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you build the technology, people come to like <laughs> use it. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, really interesting. yeah, I think ultimately the benefit of being open and allowing everyone to to use it far exceeds the well uh, hope would exceed the uh, the the risk of being uh, open because ultimately the risk yes would be from people who want to um, get the leg up on on delivering services like for you know automated marine planning but in reality they they're going to be at the same stage as everyone else so as long as the support is given to people who want to adopt it for benevolent means then hopefully uh hopefully you're you're going to your impact story is going to be a lot more positive <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i suppose yeah if if stuff ends up being used for nefarious means for <laughs> to give an example it's better for it to be open source right rather than being something proprietary used by is, is one way of looking at it. It's a really interesting topic, isn't it? Okay. Probably another video. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from anyone else? 
if not then i would like to thank james and johnny again that was that was really interesting i've, I've jotted down lots of things um to follow up on so that, that's really good um great talk this is has been recorded so it will be online later for anyone to uh watch back um the next talk i believe i'm just checking the web page now is on the 26th of mark uh, 26th of march and it's going to be with mark um what systems services can do for you, overview of CSDMS products. Um, and then we have another two talks coming up in April on the 16th and the 29th. And just for reference, I'm gonna post those quickly in the chat now. Um, Irina, did you have any closing comments? No, just to thank uh, um, James and Jonathan for like showing us and like sort of highlighting the like more infrastructure parts of the uh, of the system too, which is like something that the CSDMS community always like embraces. That there's this like whole machinery in the back end of science um, that should deliver and helps. Like it needs a lot of thought. Too. And so it's nice to see that that commonality is there across organizations and that we can learn from each other. Absolutely.